Bruchma Boyim. We are on, I believe, the sixth uh, lecture on um, the Haggadah. And the um, we were finishing off the four sons. And we're on the last son that called the She'enelo de Yodea Lisho. Son doesn't know how to ask. And the first three sons at least ask a question. And in fact, it begins by, again, why son Mahomer, what does he say? The same thing with the Russia, what does he say? Simple son, what does he say? But with the son, it's just this last son, says so she ain't the day of Son doesn't know how to ask. So the first three sons at least ask a question so you can engage in some discussion since they show some interest. But the last son doesn't know and doesn't care, or at least it seems that way. And there isn't much you can do. But what you have to do is wait, as we said, Baruch HaMokam, we have to wait for the place, which means for the opportunity. It's an interesting phenomenon in Judaism. Um, you really are, just like as you're commanded to tell someone something that they're doing wrong and to try to help them, if you know that what you're going to say to them will not be received properly, you actually have a mitzvah not to say anything. Uh, there's a quick story of a uh, of the Rishoner, of Israel of Rishon, that he took a walk with his shamus, and uh, they went to the rich part of town, and the shamus was kind of surprised because they were he had no Hasidim there, no followers, and uh, they turned into the rabbi turned into a walkway into a beautiful house, and knocked on the door, and again the shamus was very his attendant was very surprised. And uh, the president of the bank answered the door. And when he saw the rabbi, he invited him in, took him into his study. And the originator sat down in a comfortable chair and said nothing. And he was there for 15 minutes. And the banker looked at the shamus and tried to, and the shamus just shrugged his shoulders. I, I don't know. And um, after 15 minutes, the originator got up thanked the banker and walked to the door and the banker escorted the rabbi out the door and escorted him all the way back to his house and there wasn't a word exchanged between them and when they got to the door of the rebbe's house the banker finally said to the rebbe you know this is very strange you came to my house and you said nothing and i walked you all the way back you've said nothing you evidently came to my house for a reason and the originator said, I, I did come to your house for a reason. I had a request to make of you. But I know you can't do it, so I didn't want to ask you. But on the other hand, if I didn't come to your house, then how would I be fulfilling the mitzvah? So I came to your house, I said nothing, and that's how I did my part. But the banker's curiosity was now uh, you know, touched, and he said, well, why don't you ask me? Maybe I can do it. And the originator says, but I know you can't. And he pushed it. He says, no, he really asked me. Who knows? So after the banker had continued to ask, the originator finally says, you know, the poor widow that lives on the outskirts of town, the bank's holding a note on her house. I want you to give her the house free and clear. And the banker says, I can't do that. And the originator says, exactly. That's why I didn't ask you. And two days later, the uh, widow was given the deed to her house. But so with the son that doesn't know how to ask, again, you have to wait for the proper opportunity, if he's not asking, to know exactly when to approach him. Now, at the same time, we say that, what does it say? At pesachlo, but you should begin to speak to him. Now, just like, pardon me, that, and when you do talk to him, when you do find that opportunity, the word aleph tough, at is feminine for you. And you should speak to him again in a gentle and pleasant manner, a feminine way, gently, not a masculine, tough way, to be able to help him to see the proper path. Again, a person needs to know gentility generally works the best. Kindness, that's why we end the first prayer. In the standing prayer, Mugain Avram, even though we mention all three of the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But we end with the name of the shield of Abraham, because his trait was kindness. And kindness has the greatest attraction, like a magnet of any. And it says the word posach, at posach lo, you should open up to him. Now, we say in the ashray, 
open up your hand. It's interesting, when you make a fist, all of your fingers are the same, same length. But when you open them up, they're all the different length. So it says, that a person needs to open his hands when he deals with someone. And uh, you should approach each person differently. That you shouldn't, there shouldn't be just one standard way. It doesn't work. Every door, every lock has a different combination, a different key. You need to find that which works. And when it talks about the word again, apesachlo, since he is too embarrassed to ask, because again, one of the reasons might be that he's shy, you should begin the conversation, at, and explain everything from A to Z. That, let him know what it's about. And that's why the word lamor, the lamor is a gentle term, teach him until he's able to answer these questions on his own. Um, answering a question is not enough. You need to make sure the person understands the answer that you've given to that question, as long as it takes. You should have patience. When you show impatience and the person doesn't want to ask you, in fact, it's always a good idea when someone asks a question, say, good question. That It's funny, when you work out and you have a trainer, the trainer will tell you, great job. What difference does it make? In the truth of it, it makes a difference. So when you lay more, when you speak to him gently and you encourage him, it makes him want to ask more questions. Also, lay more, repeat those facts First step, so he'll be able to tell others. Uh, the Rebbe would always say that uh, always teach someone. Because if you, all you know is the Aleph base, there's someone who doesn't know Aleph base. There's always someone you can teach. And the more you teach, the more you learn. And that's how a person grows. Also, out is feminine. This is a sign of our weaknesses that such a son is found in our house. Uh, he did not reach such a state all at once. Actually, you neglected him. And now, the, and now has come the time for you to open up to him. Uh, and he becomes the essence of the mitzvah, really, of the God to Levinka and telling your son, because he knows the least. He really knows nothing. But it, it, it's really your fault, and you need to accept that, that, that responsibility. Children are our responsibility. If they're not taught, it's because we're not giving them an education. That's why it says in the Shema, and you should teach it to your children. Then, you can speak in them. It takes care of the generation gap. It's an interesting thing that parents and children really have very little to talk about. It's usually just criticism from a parent. But when you teach a child Torah, you're learning the same book. The 85-year-old scholar and the 5-year-old child are both learning the exact same book. There is a, a communication between them. But the bar to bomb to speak in bays, the first letter of the written Torah, Beratius, first letter of the oral Torah, the Amosai bum of speaking in the words of Torah, and the generation gap is now no longer exists. They have what to speak about. And it continues in the verse and it says, to say, Levinka you shall tell your child on that day saying, Again, Vigarko, that is the mitzvah ase, one of the two positive commandments of the day, of the night, of talking about the going out of Egypt. Bav Vorzeh, because of this, Asa Shem Libet Seis Mitzrayim, that God took me out from the land of Egypt. Again, a person has to feel on this night as if he is within the moment that we are leaving Egypt. Because so, time and space do not exist for God. So a person at the Seder actually needs to plug in to that spiritual power that the Jews had when they left Egypt. Because a person is actually able to take that time machine and become part of this process on a spiritual level of the Jews leaving Egypt. And amazingly, if you can go backwards, you can go forward. We can also plug into Mashiach. A person can even find the Messiah if he looks hard enough within his own being, even though it hasn't come for the world. Now, there are a couple thoughts also on uh, when it began. It said, with the four sons, it said, Baruch HaMokom. And we translate it to mean is that blesses the place, the Temple Mount, or Hamokam, the name of God. But Baruch Hamokam also, blessed is the place, that we need to thank God for whatever place we are in now, since that is the place we need to be. A person needs to, be, needs to know that in this world nothing is an accident. If you are in a certain place, in a certain city, in a certain community, even, next, even in a certain house, in a certain seat in shul, there's a reason for it. Nothing is an accident. Um, my father would always say, shiny, shiny makam, shiny mazel. If a person changes his place, he changes his luck, so to speak. 
and again, that a person needs to be in a place because a person's place will also help him. If you're in a perfume store and you buy nothing, you smell better, as the Gemara says. And again, we can know the opposite would be as well. Also, in addition, when it talks in that the beginning verse of the four sons, it talks about echad, the word echad four times. That echad, echad chacham, one is a wise son, one is an evil son. And the numerical value we said of the word echad was 13. And four times 13 we mentioned was the name Eliyahu, Elijah the prophet who will herald in, herald in the coming of the Messiah, of Mashiach. And the word Ahava, love, also has numerical value of 13. So the word Echad, which alludes to God, but also alludes to love. That when we know that the first thing we say when we begin our davening is I accept upon myself the mitzvahs I say, the positive commandment, the Ahav to the Rech of to love my brother as myself. So you have these four different brothers. But when there's echad between them, when there's octus, when there's brotherly love between them, the four together bring in the 52 of Elio, which is Mashiach. And we need to know how important this is. It's not for us to judge each other. It's for us to love each other. Again, echad, the gemachi of the word ahava, of love. Now, when it says, I said, As Hashem Li, God did for me, that we answer the Russia with the same answer the Torah gives to the She'ena de Elisha, the son does not ask. As Hashem Li, God did to me. But with the evil son, with the Russia, we add, Li velo lo, me but not him. Why don't we say the same to the son who does not ask? After all, that's where the, the original answer that we have comes from. So Kliyakar answers that there can be two reasons as to why the son doesn't ask a question. One, he's shy, or that he just doesn't care. And so the Kliyakar says, why assume the worst? Give him the benefit of the doubt and say he is shy and not evil, and answer him accordingly, and therefore we don't answer him, leave a low low. You, and, not, and, and you, they, if you were there, you wouldn't have been taken out. But we assume that he's just shy. The Russia, on the other hand, is being contentious. He's challenging. Therefore, we give him that answer. Now, one of the questions that we ha might want to think about, how old are these sons? What are we looking at? So some say they represent two separate generations. So they're really, in a sense, from, from old age to youth. Um, and that's the story of our present generation. See, in previous generations, there was a Zayda, there was a grandfather, and he was the Chacham. He was the wise son. And when his grandson, the Tom, the simple son, would ask his father, the evil son, a question, a religious question, what, he, what the father would say is, go ask your Zayda. Go ask your grandfather. That's what he, he knows about that. But now that the Zayda has passed on, the Russia now becomes the grandfather. The father becomes a Tom, just a simple person. And the child is either shy or could care less. And if he cares, neither his father nor his grandfather can give him an answer. And it's the sadness of the generation. And that's what we see here. Continues in the Haggadah, it talks about Yochum e Rosh Chodesh. So I would think that the time that we should uh, bring the Paschal offering is from Rosh Chodesh. Talmud the Torah tells us, no, by Yomahu on that day. Now, it's interesting. So why are we dealing with this? Why not just tell us when? Why, are we, why is it I might think? Because a theory in Torah is also Torah, even one that is rejected. This is verses, because the truth of the matter is, is that Torah law and civil law are really the same. It's both a legal, uh, if you have a library, it's a legal library. Difference being is that Torah law is, 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 is something that we do to be protective to stop us before we do something. And uh, secular law is really to, uh, to uh, punish a person for what he's already done, so to speak. So one's preventative, and the other one is for, for a punishment. And uh, so when we have a law, civil law, it doesn't make a difference what the minor opinion was because we don't follow it. In Jewish law, there is a concept of the hatchila and bidyevet, 
what we follow initially, which is the major opinion. But in times of need, we also can follow the minor opinion. So therefore, both theories, even the one that we don't follow, is important. Also, first, that got to tell us how the story should be told, and now when it should be told, based on Elias uh, Haggadah. Now, it says, by Yomahu, so why the term on that day? means on no other night of the year are there obligations that must be, be carried out only then and not by day. So in a sense, the night of Pesach is very much a day based on a gra. Also, the Chidah states that on the night of the redemption, the Jews in Egypt experienced bright sunshine as if it were mid midday, that uh, there was a miracle again in that sense. Uh, based on the Haggadah here. Now, it continues, so if it's on that day, I would think, when it's still day, because of this, that we, we talk about all of this is when we have matzah and mur resting before us. Now, why with matzah and mur before us? The answer is don't teach a child theory. When, whenever you can deal with things that are real and tangible, by all means, do that. Um, and this the Art Bums talks about this becomes important that always, if you can point to something, show something, a child's going to remember it. When you deal with abstracts, it doesn't have the same power to it. Now, it continues with um, the next paragraph: Mitchila Oved Avodizor Hayavosenu. That initially our forefathers were idol worships or worshippers, uh, and and but actually now came and welcome the Also, God has brought us to His service, as it says. Yeshua said to the people, "So says the Lord God." By Avery Yardane on the other side of the Jordan, Yoshua Vosechem, that that's where our forefathers um, dwelt. They owe them from from ever. Now, why mention this? That our initially our forefathers were idol worshippers. So there are a few different reasons that are given. One is to tell us that we can always do tshuva, we can always repent, no matter how long we have, no matter how low we have sunk, that our history began with the service of idols, and we grew into a righteous nation. And even Terach, the father of Avram Avinu, who was the greatest uh, idol worship merchant in the city, he too did tshuva and uh, was given a place in the world to come, based on the vote of Yisrael. Also, that it is easy for a father to love a perfect child, but loving a wayward child shows, shows much more meaningfulness and affection based on Ksav Soifer. You know, it's really it's interesting that a son who has who was challenged, who was not as gifted, is really our challenge. And that's where we really have our great nachas, helping a child that needs help to make his life better, to help him to grow, to be, as I always say, the miraglim, the spies to help a child to spy out the world and help him to find his way through it by uh, pointing out those difficulties that he may incur. Also, it's not important where you start. So even though they were idol worships, what's important is where you finish, based on Mace Mordechai. You know, many times people want to know about everything in the past. It's not necessary. What you are, who you are today is the culmination of what you've gone through, the good and the bad. Take one thing out and everything else changes. So people are judging people of what they did 20 years ago, 30 years ago. It's really ridiculous. In the middle of campaigns, they talk about it all the time. That's why you are who you are. By the mistakes that you made, you learn nothing from success. You learn a lot from failure. Good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. Very important. Uh, in addition, um, only... Only by being aware, the morale says, of where we came from can we appreciate just how far we've come. You know, sometimes people will mark on a wall in a child's bedroom their age and how tall they were. And then as they get tall, older, you know, they make more marks. And when the child grows up and he sees that, it always brings a smile to his face. I do that with the Sfarim, with the books that I've gone through. I write in words. And then when I go over the books, years later, and I see the words that I've written in that today I wouldn't put. It gives me a great amount of enjoy, enjoyment to know that I've grown, because many times we don't see it ourselves. My wife's from Philadelphia, and she would take the, keep my children for a visit for a week, and when they would come back, they'd be taller. 
it's funny, when they were living with me, I never saw them grow. But when they were gone for a week, all of a sudden they looked taller. So that becomes a key also of how much we've grown. It's important for people to know that. Sometimes you need someone else to tell you that. Also, the duty to eat matzah and abstain from chametz on Pesach can be seen as a way of correcting the sin of Adam and Chava, a first man and woman. According to some commentaries, the tree of knowledge was actually wheat. The wheat grew on a tree ready to eat. That's why with the sweat of your brow, you will eat bread. That's why it's so difficult to produce bread. So by us eating only flat and tasteless matzah, lechem oni, uh, the, the poor man's bread, we turn our back against the pride and desire that prompted Adam and Chava to sin, which is symbolized by the leaven in the bread, based on, again, in the Elias uh, Agar. And it says they came to Avar Yardain from the other side of the, of the, of the river, that according to the Hasidus, the word river serves as a simile for the attribute of Bina, which is understanding. Our ancestors, meaning the roots of the nation Israel, of Israel, are beyond the river, above the level of intellect based on the Alta Rebbe. It's what we do and what we have is not based on intellect. It's based on a Muna, even though we need to use our intellect to find God. But in the end, it's something that's within us that we know and believe. And it says that Terach Avi Avram, that Terach was the father of Abraham. Again, he was not a worshiper of Avi Nochor. The Avdol and they served other gods. And I took Abraham, your father, from the other side of the, of the river. the Eretz Canaan, and I brought him, I gave him into the whole land of Canaan, which again is Israel. It says, Arba Zaro, and I increased his seed, children. Vetan Lois Yitzchak, and I gave him his Yitzchak. Vetan Yitzchak is Yaakov as Esau. And I gave to, uh, Yitzch- to Yitzchak both Yaakov and Esau. We know they were twins. Now, why the word ve'etain twice that I gave? By that name is the word matona, is a gift, since both Sarah and Rivka were barren based on a girl, which is interesting. Three out of four of the mothers of Israel were barren. Why? It would, you would think that they would have children very easily. After all, they were blessed people and very righteous people. And uh, the commentaries tell us that the reason was that God loves the prayers of the righteous. But that's strange. What do righteous people do but pray? So why would he need the prayers of the righteous? And from this we see that when a person has a need, no matter how much you pray, when you have a need, you pray much greater, even a righteous person. And that becomes sometimes what God does is helps us to come closer to him by creating these situations. And it says, Why? Vietan Esav is our Seir, the so. And God gave Esav, the mountain of Seir, to inherit. The Yaakov of Yard Mitzrayim and Yaakov and his children went down to Egypt. Now the question becomes, why does the Haggadah mention Esav and his inheritance? Strange. The answer is that when God made the promise to Abram Vinu at the Bris Bain Hapsorim, at the, at the covenant between the parts where the animals were cut in half. That's, he told Abram Ravino that his offspring would have to spend 400 years in servitude in the foreign land. And so Esau, who was living in his own land in tranquility, could not be the offspring that God was referring to as a seed of Abram Ravino. In fact, there are those who say that he purposely left not to be part of this, to not have to be part of the slavery that the Jews would have to go through. And again, many times people do that. They take the, the short end rather than taking the, the long road, so to speak, for the greater benefit. In fact, Tanya talks about a man who came to a city and uh, there was a young man sitting at the, at the crossroad to the city and he said, which is the way into the city? And the young man said, if you go to the left, it's the short, long road. And if you go to the right, it's the long, short road. So the man thought he wanted to take the short Long roads, he went, took the short, and he went a short distance, and he found he could see the city, but there was a wall, and he couldn't go over the wall. So he had to turn around and come back. And he, asked, he, he rebuked the young man, and he said, why don't you tell me? He said, I did. I said, it was a short, long road. If the other one is a long road, but you'll get to the city, and that's what it's about. And in life, one needs to know that many times things may seem a little long, when you go the right way, the end is worthwhile. And it continues, and it says... Baruch Shomer Haftachaso, blessed is uh, one who keeps his promise to Israel, Baruch Now, what's so great? So we're blessing God for keeping his promise to Israel. What's so great about God keeping his promise? After all, we have to do that also. 
Now, the answer is because he could have kept his promise through Asa, but he chose Yaakov Vinu instead. So therefore, we're thanking God for doing it through us and not through Asa, based on the Yad Chazaka. Or again, or it could have been Yishmael, again, with, through Abba Mavinu. Um, and it says that this is connected to the Gemara and Brachos, that teaches us that we are to thank God for the bad. Uh, really, I said nothing is bad, the bitter. Just as we thank him for the good. And so too, to, so to discharge this obligation, the Haggadah offers a blessing for the exile. Uh, so the book of God keeping his promise, even though it was an exile, it was for our benefit. Just like with Yosef, it says that his father, Shomer es Adover, that his father guarded the thing when, when Yosef told him about the dream of the stars and the sky and the moon and the sun is bowing down to him. Uh, well, Shomer then, Rashi said, was waiting for the dream to come true. Shomer guarding it. So to God, Shomer Haftosli Yisrael was waiting impatiently for the redemption of the nation of Israel. God wants to bring the redemption more than we want it. Just like a father who anticipates and looks forward to the successes of his children. And then it continues and it says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu Chishev that he already thought about the end. Lasos Kamosham and Avram Avinu as God had told Abraham and Brisbane and Absarim at the covenant between the parts. What does it mean, Chishev is a case? He thought about the end. That the uh, forefathers knew about the 400 years of slavery. And this Makshava, this thought, Chishev, of the anguish is able to remove that, that their, their, ang their, 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 their suffering, just to the thought of it, the Kates. Okay? Was Kates is numerical value of 190. That because of their anguish of, of the Jews being in slavery, that anguish was able to remove 190 years, which is the numerical value of the word Kates from the slavery in Egypt. So instead of 400 years, it was only 210 based on a Kedusha Slavi. And it continues, Bris ben Absarim. Now a Bris cannot, a covenant cannot be broken, but a promise can be if the conditions of that promise are not met. And so the Gemara in Shabbos states that schut avot, that the merit of the forefathers may end. But Brit Avot, but the treaty of the Avos is eternal, based on a brisker love, and that's why it's so important that it's mentioned. And it says, V'yomer al Avram, uh, then God said to Avram, Yodei you shall know, Kigirir Zaracha, that your children will be strangers, but Eretz lo lahem, in a land that's not theirs, Avodum, and they will serve them there, Vino Osam, and they will be afflicted there, Arba Meoshana, 400 years. Now when it talks about there'll be strangers, this alludes to the tribe of Levi, because the tribe of Levi were not enslaved, but they were strangers. Be'eretz Lolahem, in a land that's not theirs, again, meaning by the taskmasters of the Egyptians. And the Inosam, and then the, they'll be afflicted, talks about the rest of the nation. Now when it talks about it by a land that's not theirs, now we know that if you read in the book of Bereshit, it says that during the, the years of famine, in Egypt, the people sold their land. After they sold everything else and they had nothing to eat, they sold the land to Paro during the years of famine. And it was then a land that did not belong to them. It belonged to Paro. And they were, so to speak, sharecrackers. So Yosef also moved everyone because of this to another location when his family came to Egypt so that they would not feel like strangers since everyone was a stranger because he moved them all around. And therefore they felt better about what it was. Again, he was trying to make them feel comfortable. In fact, some say that's why he had the Egyptians circumcise themselves, so that the Jews would also circumcise themselves and would not feel strange, since everyone in Egypt at that time was circumcised. And it says, that, um, and to serve them. And it says both uh, Paro and Vuchanetzer showed respect to God by walking four cubits, when they heard God's name. Paro was war reward, though, was three times greater than Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. He had the Jews enslaved for 70 years, Paro for 210. Question is why? What's the difference? They both walked four cubits. The answer is that the Paro was a midget. So his four steps, it took him, it took him three times as much 
to do since he, his steps were shorter, being a midget. So therefore, his reward was three times greater based on the owner Abbasids. And that's why his, the time of the servitude was three times greater in Egypt than it was for the destruction of the first temple. And it says that uh, for 400 years, because Avramin questioned God with the words, Bamea Eda, how will I know? And in the Atbash, as we mentioned before, changing the letters, the numerical value of the word Bama is Shin Yud Dalit, is 400. So again, that's where the 400 years, because Abraham asked the question. And also the nation that I will serve there, Don Anochi, I will judge. And uh, what does it mean that I will judge? There is a concept in halacha of kum lehmen or when a person is only punished for the most severe of the sins that he did. If you kill someone and break something, that you don't get punished for the thing you broke, only for you being put to death since that's the more severe. Um, so if that's the case, well, only, why is that they, the Egyptians, that their wealth was taken and they were killed, drowned in the sea? The answer is that this thing of only one punishment, commonly Rabune, is only in relation to the earthly court. But this punishment that came from the Egyptians came from the heavenly court. Dun Anochi, I will judge, God says. So therefore they were punished for both. And it says, and afterwards, Yetzu, they would go out, with, with great wealth, and um, Again, this connects with the, uh, this Berchush Gadol will connect with the next part of the Hisha Amda, a very famous uh, verse um, that, and he, that God will stand for us throughout all time. Now, it says that the Achor, they they, not the where they should leave. The Torah should have written Achor and not the Yud making Achare, you would have a numerical value of 10, alludes to the fact they would leave only after the 10 plagues, based on Das Sekenim. And also, it's the, they shall leave. Uh, the going out from Egypt is mentioned 50 times in the Torah, to allude to the fact that God performed 50 redemptions in Egypt, for it was from the 49th level of impurity that he took us out. Had he had let us reach the 50th, of the level of impurity, that's the abyss, we would have stayed in Egypt forever. And so God took us out at the last possible moment and led us step by step to the 50th level of purity, the day of what we call Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah, based on a Sfasem. And I think what we're going to do, um, I think we're going to stop here. I'd like to do, add one more thing and then we'll continue with the next paragraph next time. That it talked about about the about the uh, in the end, God God figured out what the end would be. Kate's numerical value, again, which would be at 210 from the 400. That the redemption was premature. 210 years, just like a pregnancy. That seven months is 210 days. So God took us out prematurely, and a person needs to know again. But it was still a viable birth. The nation was born from it. And again, so next week we'll continue with lifting up the cup and connecting this Rechush Gadol, this great wealth, with the words Vahisha Amda, that this is what God uh, did, that, that he stood by our fathers and us uh, throughout history, and especially then. Again, thank you very much for coming. God bless, and have a good Shabbos.